Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to yet another issue of the Grey Market Talk. After we skipped last week because I was traveling to Berlin on some business. Hello, Nick. Good to see you. Good to see you, as always. It's always fake, you know. It's good to see you. We already spoke for two hours in the green room, but hey, everybody expected, so we're doing it as well. Coming back to Berlin, the first time I flew to Brandenburg Airport. You know this airport? We Germans took 30 years to build and cost 15 times as much. Right. You have to go by train into the city, and the train takes one hour and 15 minutes, 21 stops. It's not a fast train. There is no fast train. It took me longer to go into Berlin City than fly from Frankfurt to Berlin. That's uh, that's not good. It's awesome. Huh? For the, the capital city. In the past, you could fly into Tegel. Within five minutes, you were with a taxi at your hotel. I mean, we're on air, but my last trip to Berlin on a on a train um, um, was, I think, in January, and uh, um, in a first class compartment, uh, people were smoking weed. Um, but, oh, lovely! Know, just just for the potential tourists we might have. Oh, we're, it's now legal in Germany and as it's well. It's now right? legal, but not still not on a train. Yeah, well, we had, we had the discussion. Should one invest now in weed paraphernalia? You know, the the, the old uh, uh, analysis. You're not investing in exploration of gold, but you supply uh, all the material the gold miners would use. But the Germans have actually regulated it again in a, in the most mad way. As a grown-up, you're allowed to have three plants at home. Not four, but three. Yeah. So all the ideas of buying UV lamps and all the stuff out of the window. But at least from, I think, the end of this month on, I can change my gender once a year. Uh, at least they're focusing on the things that matter. The real problems in Germany, yeah. We're, so we're sorting them out slowly, but steady. Holy moly. Let's start with the real <laughs> things about the market. Introduction. My most famous guest, Nick Themistocle, portfolio manager, former uh, market vigilante, market maker, uh, who is and has managed assets in the... I want to say hundreds of billions, shall we show, in the tens of billions on the upper scale, uh, all sorts of asset classes. What we're going to do today, we have a general look, a brief look into the market. And then because people are, well, totally requesting it, we're going into Elliott Wave and look at one of the things that really tickles me fancy at the moment, gold. Yeah, I'm really interested what the magic of Elliott Wave, the analysis of what investors generally do if they behave in these fractal patterns uh, would let us assume um, what could happen next in the gold market. Because finally, we see this move. Uh, we were talking about, you mentioned earlier in the green room, pretty much in the first show, our exposure. Yeah, indeed. Huh? In, indeed, that's that's absolutely right. Gold and Bitcoin, and the reason why from a macro perspective, you know, because of the money printing and the fact that they have to continue money printing because they don't seem to have another choice. Well, it's 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 actually a very easy explanation. Yeah, why is gold so strong at the moment? I think the last person has realized that sooner or later the central banks will have to open the floodgates again and print useless currency. And as we've seen in the history for the last, I don't know, six thousand years, all fiat currency eventually go to zero. It takes. Okay. Might take some time, but hey, it will, it will go there. Yeah? You as a Brit, the pound used to be the envy of the world. Yeah. Not really anymore, right? Well, no, and, and that's that's absolute. Not not anymore, but not any, as you rightly say, you know, you'd struggle to find a fiat currency that, uh, that you can trust. And, uh, uh, but, but let's not forget, in the printing season of, uh, of COVID, it was only really the the US and uh, uh, the Europeans less so, um, and the Brits that did all the printing. The Chinese didn't do it. The Japanese didn't do it really. So you know, it was it was was a Western thing. Yeah, well, in China they have now the real. We mentioned that Richard Ku was there. Uh, the balance sheet recession. They had. They don't have a problem with inflation. They have a problem with deflation right now. Absolutely right. Absolutely. They actually don't have enough. I mean, if you look at sort of some of the analysis there, their money supply is around eight percent per year, which sounds ginormous, you know, by Western standards. Um, you know, the, the Americans should have around five and a half to six percent uh, money supply um, printing, as it were. But um, China at eight and a half is way too low for them, yeah, for the stage they're in. So is uh, a general stock market P of eight, nine cheap at the moment in China or not? 
Well, Blue that's the point. Brown. That that is the point. And uh, again, there is an analysis out there, or there are loads of analysis out there that basically say that uh, these sort of P levels of uh, eight, nine, ten. That's what they are. Usually form um, bottoms, but you normally need a catalyst to actually take you off there. But you know, if there's if there's any point to buy, it seems to be that eight, nine, ten has been a good low. Well, it's generational it's, low, isn't it? Isn't it a low when there's actually capitalism working in the background? It must not necessarily being a low if it's not capitalism. If the state is getting involved, it, I think it could go far lower. Well, th that's an interesting thing because the state sometimes are forced to react um, in a capitalistic way when things aren't working, as we've seen in the past. Holy moly. I really, uh, if, you, if you see what's going on at the moment in the world, it's we're, we're focusing on problems that aren't problems and the real problems are being left on the side. And uh, the guys in charge, well, would you hire any of those guys in charge? For your I business, hire anyone in charge anywhere. See that if it's that, if it's sort of in the political sphere. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but oddly enough, all of these people end up in industry afterwards, and uh, and that's a scary thing. It's fascinating. We are doomed. We're absolutely doomed. We don't have to wait for an asteroid to have an impact. We do it all by ourselves. I we think. are television stars. <laughs> good. Hey, let's get one of those slide decks up and show. Uh, I don't have prepared a lot today, but uh, there are some that are actually quite interesting. So share, share. You seeing the presentation, Nick? I certainly can. Interesting. I can't see it. I can see it. You're on Grey Market Talk. You... Sorry, sorry, sorry. Something. Yeah. Now let's try that again. Share screen. Grey Market Talk. So, 14th of April, 2024. And uh, it's different, isn't it, Nick? Uh, I found this fantastic. Fascinating charts. I discussed that with Murat. Uh, now, two Murats monthly in a row. Before March, that the seasonality would actually suggest that we see a March dip, which clearly did not happen. And I came across this chart in my inbox on LinkedIn. And uh, the good people of, what's it called? Kobe's Seal Letter. Yeah. Uh, Source Goldman, Global Investment Research. So, yeah, uh, came across this chart, which shows <laughs> us the performance of the S&P at the moment, uh, back-tested, or not back-tested, with data from 76 till 2023, the median is the green uh, thing that goes from the bottom left to the top right until March. And then we see presidential election years and non-presidential election years. The interesting thing is in presidential election years, the correction in March was always quite distinct. What we also see just before the election in November, we will always see a correction, at least the history suggests. However, now we see March and the market did something completely not expected. It went up and it made new all-time highs and everybody is talking about, uh, well, well, everybody's hatching themselves. Let's put it that way. Yeah, eventually we'll see a recession, but not just now, right? So what, what's your take? What's your take? Is it different now, or uh, are Look, we coming crashing down to reality? I, the world has got so much information, and the you know YouTube and and uh, social media. To be frank, everyone sees these charts every day. So if you looked at this chart last year, and we were talking about presidential cycle being an important year last year, so we we said, look, you know, ahead of, you know, things do go well, and. Um, and you know that things that the uh, the market's going to go up ten percent. So what? You're not going to buy it in January and uh, um, February and 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 sort of expect this ten percent. You've got your ten percent now. Now the question is, what do you do? It's the same thing as Bitcoin halving. You know, people say, oh, after the Bitcoin halving, things go up. So therefore, I buy it now. And that's kind of this year. In the last twelve months, people have been and acting a, a little bit sort of ahead of the curve. Um, and maybe that's why. I mean, if I were to give an explanation for what's gone on, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's behaving differently. It's behaving excessively. Or is there something else fundamental to this where people have kind of figured out, yep, they're going to have to print. They're going to have to cap interest rates. 
and therefore I want this stuff on my books. So it's the protective acid, protective acid bubble I've created a new world, haven't I? Well, you, you, you have. I mean, and, and let's not forget, everybody last year was super, super duper bearish, right? And they only turned around their books in December. So this excessiveness in Q1, you know, okay, in retrospect, is probably easier to call. I didn't call it, but it's probably easier to understand, given that everyone was so bearish last year and everyone turned around in December and everyone is still buying. And so what you normally see spread across a year kind of happened all in one go um, or over this this quarter. Uh, maybe it's over uh, oh, for now. Maybe uh, it's it's it's, it's the, the the mindset has changed. I ha I hate the word mindset, but uh, in the past you bought stocks, especially equities, when you thought, oh, good growth rates, good earnings, yeah, uh, <laughs> good economy. Uh, this stuff will go up in value. They'll make generate profits, revenues. I want to have some of that action. Um, this is the normal situation why people should buy equities yeah, to participate in the growth of an economy and make money out of it. Uh, I seem to detect the mindset we were, especially you were discussing on this channel for quite a while to saying, yeah, what, what cannot happen or what must not happen cannot happen. Therefore, where do you put your money in if the printing presses eventually will start going crazy because they have no other choice? The choice would be declaring bankruptcy. It's not going to happen. What can they do? They can always print money or they can produce more stuff. More producing more stuff would mean taking regulation down and reducing taxes. They clearly don't want to do that. Uh, that would be stupid. Oh, my God. How can politicians ever attack the other side of the equation of stopping inflation? So, yeah, that's what's going to happen. You want to park your money in assets which represent real value. And that is also, we haven't prepared it for today, but an explanation for what we've seen in the energy, energy sector for the last month. Yeah, indeed. I mean, people have figured out already last year, you know, that uh, you want to protect your portfolio against the effects of longer term inflation. And by longer term inflation, you know, it's really about monetary inflation rather than, um, you know, there's a supply sort of blockage here and there, which usually gets fixed. Um, and, and this longer term inflation is something that is increasingly kind of you know, at the forefront of everything we do, which is why we talk about gold, why we talked about gold, why we talk about Bitcoin, um, because monetary inflation is a, is, is a major um, um, thing because it seems to be the only solution for governments on the horizon is to print their way out of, uh, of, of a problem. Uh, well, we've seen the CPI figures this week. Uh, didn't look fantastic, huh? so... Sooner or later, Nick, they're going to clear that three or three and a half is the new two and be done with it. Yeah, I mean, CPI is all very well. I mean, it's great for day traders and it's it's clearly got everyone in a bit of a tiz this week. Um, but, um, you know, the, the Fed are very focused on PC, not CPI. Um, and, um, and the two are calculated differently. Uh, we'll see. Uh, I don't think PC is coming out to the end of this month, but um, but that's um, the forecasts, at least the nowcasts, are not so um, scary with uh, with PCE. So that still has a you know reasonable handle, reasonable sort of um, a level, and not this sort of excessive level that we saw with CPI. Well, I, I still believe they will have to lower interest rates because sooner, sooner or later the recession will hit. And there's no doubt about that. Yeah, Even if CPI is high, they, don't, they will not care at this moment. They will just open the doors, uh, provide fresh liquidity to market and reduce it. And I've put up the, a nice picture of uh, from top-down charts, also from my LinkedIn feed, which gives a general explanation about the cycle. And I found that especially for... Well, the newcomers to the markets who are who are interested how markets generally work, it shows the whole uh, the whole uh, investment cycle from expensive to cheap. Yeah? And at the moment, if you focus on the right side, it says tricky, expensive, but momentum likely runs. And I think we can all agree that's where we are at the moment. If we look at all metrics we have there, equity markets by no means are cheap. Not at all, especially if inflation uh, seems to be a topic which is not coming down at the moment, but momentum points to the upside. So we are in the most difficult phase for an investor out there, 
what to do with your money at the moment. What would be your recommendation, Nick? What's your positioning? If we are, in fact, in a phase like that, where momentum points upwards, we see that clearly we had new all-time highs. Yeah, The market uh, doesn't seem to go into uh, an immediate uh, well, correction right now, uh, but we are we're still we're still not cheap. Yeah? We we all know the figure of Nvidia, thirty three times earnings uh, or, or revenues uh, valuation. That's not a cheap market in the driver of the markets, the whole AI thing. Yeah, indeed. Um, well, my view is still, you know, this sort of allocation of uh, gold, crypto, and and equities as being the you know the foundation of, uh, of of a portfolio today, but there's a difference between sort of a strategic play and a tactical play. And tactically, you know, at the moment, perhaps we're you know we've overcooked it. Um, um, but strategically, you know, we're not at the end of this run. And your chart shows here, and, and Murat's presentation last week, which I thought was excellent. I should say moin to uh, to Murat. Um, I thought it was excellent. You know, basically said, you know, we're not quite at the end of this of this run. Um, and you can see that through this bottom-up analysis of the, uh, you know, the various um, um, things that he uh, he tests for. Um, yeah, so we're not the end of the equity run, but tactically we might well be in a stage where we do see that sort of more downside than upside. I'd expected more downside than upside up to now, not just the cyclical um, things that you showed, but you know, look to me as though we're kind of getting close to this zone. And if you're close to the zone, you know, you've got more downside than upside. And I spoke to, you know, one of our clients last week and I said, my view is, well, you know, we've got 100 points upside in the S&P and 400 points downside. So, you know, what would you do in this situation is is tactically wait before you um, um, chuck some money at the market again. Yes, also the technical situation. A lot of guys who love technical analysis are talking about the 20-day moving average. And... Uh, yeah, well, take it with a pinch of salt. But if everybody's talking about it, I listen because that's what moving market. So we dip below the 20, uh, 20 day moving average in the S&P. We were trying an attempt to close above it. We didn't manage to do that. So a lot of the very short term technical traders out there are focusing at the moment what's going to happen if we violate the temporary low we had before that. That is clearly a sign that we are in for, well, at least a, a little correction, in the S&P, which we discussed here out of different motivation for a while now but yeah. that would seem to uh match the expectations the market sees and this weekend uh, uh geopolitically we had uh, uh iran was attacking israel again the iron dome seemed to have hold uh, i was wondering what that's going to do on monday for energy prices or generally the market will it have an impact on the market or not i have no idea well i mean it's an emotional Kind of thing and the first uh sort of sense of a middle east conflict in october um the knee-jerk reaction of a lot of um you know clients that we talked to were you know get me out as it were um and um you know we said you know don't don't be silly um and um and, and that really was very close to a low i think that was around 4300 or so in the s p um this level we're at a much higher uh point in the s p and so there's a lot of or, you know, lots of good news in the market right now, still. Um, and therefore, I think the emotion might play a little bit different. And you've already seen the markets that are open over the weekend, uh, crypto. Um, you know, the crypto market got absolutely mullered um, in the last 24 hours. So you've seen some recovery, but you see that natural, you know, risk off kind of thing. I don't know what's going to happen on Monday. So what can I sell today? Oh, let's go and sell some crypto. Um, and, um, you know, I'll substitute, I'll buy back my crypto on Monday and I'll sell my S&P or whatever it is, if this thing does, uh, does escalate. And I think, you know, it's a different environment today than it was in October um, last year for, for the market. And I think market, you know, they just they're looking for bad news now so you saw the reaction on cpi the old days they just didn't care about stuff like that now they really do care about it and uh, and i think the the emotion tactically there means that uh, you know it might be they look for any reason to uh, to perhaps push this thing a little bit lower yeah, I was. Um, we had this conversation before. I was wondering how weak the United States is because they should have months ago uh, take all participating parties in this conflict aside and say, "Cut it out, guys. It's over." 
stop that rubbish. It's not good for anybody what's going to happening there. And they don't seem to have the power to do that, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think they've not been listened to. Um, you know, maybe they're losing some of their global respect. Um, but in, in the current circumstance, I mean, you know, if we just take this weekend's action to the side, you know, I think they uh, um, they're saying the right things, at least to uh, to everybody. Well, let's hope so. So um, coming to the bond markets, that was also one of the interesting slides um, from Bloomberg. It's about credit spreads relative to the last 20 years. And this chart shows us and I'm not a bond guy, so we had to clean that up first. It shows that bond spreads, which means what is paid by investors for risky <laughs> assets above the, well, the, the risk-free asset is far too low in this scenario. And that, in my opinion, doesn't really reflect the risks geopolitically as well as uh, in the economy or on the fiscal side we are seeing at the moment. Is there an opportunity for the trade? Because we are everywhere, we are as tight as it can possibly get. Well, it can go, it can get always get tighter. But uh, uh, on a medium term, I think all this stuff is far too, and that's where you corrected me. Do we call it in bond terms now cheap or expensive? It's too expensive, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, where I come from, um, I would call a tight spread, i.e. the yield on a credit bond versus the yield on a government bond. So that's the spread. If the spread is very narrow, then I call that bond expensive. Yep. And, um, and so I guess your red zone and your green zone here are the kind of historical spread levels over the last, it says, 20 years. You know, and if you look at the middle one, European corporate bonds, I guess this is investment grade um, um, bonds are kind of in the middle, um, whereas everything else is in the red zone and um, US investment grade. Um, look at it, it's, it's trading at 87 basis points uh, spread. I mean, that's for two reasons. One is that the government bond market is very, very high in, in yield terms historically. Um, and so when investors come to buy something, if you say, I will give you 5%. I say, oh, yeah, I'll have some of that. Um, and, and that just sort of sometimes results in a, in a narrow spread because the absolute level becomes very interesting. But the combination of the fact that you've got less concern in the US here, we talk about US now, um, of a recession. And you can see that from the stock market. You can see that everything one is gun ho Well, what is the reason for credit spreads to widen out? If geopolitical problems would affect the stock market as well as the bond market, if it was a price factor, it's clearly not. So I think a combination of absolute yield attractiveness on bonds, combined with the fact that you know there's no on the horizon at least for the for the market um, fear of a recession, um, that's why you end up with with tight spreads. Because I, I was looking at the HYG high yield uh, ETF in the US and Adam Taggart, he had a fantastic line I laughed my head off on thoughtful money. Yeah, they were talking about the lag effect. And he said, well, it's, we had this conversation here with his guests. And he said uh, that the Python ate the pig and now the pig is working its way through the Python. And then he made a break and said, and then it seems the Python took some Ozempic and the pig's got a bit smaller. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the explanation, because I think U.S. high yield shouldn't be where they are at the moment, especially by the refinancing wall. We talked about that half a year ago. Now we are closing in into that time period where they sooner or later will have to start refinancing in the U.S. market. And we still have extremely high yields. Well, extremely high. Let's, let's also call a spade a spade. Yeah? When, when 25 years ago, when we were in the markets, these were normal interest rate levels. Uh, we've oh. just went. <laughs> we were just went back to normal uh, compared to the zero point five percent for ten years uh, we've seen a couple of years ago. So, uh, not yeah. the time to worry just yet, Nick. Or yeah, I'm I'm less stressed about credit, and I, you know, I I have um, I, I speak to to clients in this zone, and and for the last basically year and a bit um i've not really been bothered by um credit spreads for the reason as, as i mentioned earlier i think absolute yield levels are very high and i think you know the chance of a recession is re very low and remember last year when everyone was talking recession 
these spreads were much wider. And that was a great opportunity to go and ship something in. So as long as you don't worry about recession, um, then, you know, credit seems to be um, still OK. Of course, the middle block here, you know, you've got it highlighted, Euro, Euro investment grade. And if you compare that versus, um, you know, these other markets, what's different with Euro? Well, two things different. One, the yields on government bonds are much lower. So the absolute yield level of credit is, you know, relatively much lower. So you command a little bit of a wider spread. So that's the first factor. And the second factor is uh, the European economy is in a lot worse shape than uh, than its peers. Um, and, you know, you, you again need a little bit of a premium for that. Is 109 the right number? I don't know, to be honest with you. Yeah, well, I wouldn't invest in in European investment grade. They are blowing it up big time at the moment. Anyway, uh, before we come to the highlight of the show, uh, fear and greed index. We always had extreme greed or greed over the last weeks. Now, for the first time, we've dipped into neutral territory uh, on the CNN fear and greed index. I find that actually quite refreshing. It also implies if people are getting more to the neutral side, they're not foaming at the mouth to buy and set market makers short. Yeah? Uh, buy more NVIDIA, Apple, Tesla, you name it, out of the money calls to force market makers simply, we are price insensitive to buy more in the equity underlying itself to put our hedges on. That should also give, I think in this case, uh, not a contra-cyclical uh, indication, but a pro-cyclical. That, yeah, if the market is on neutral at the moment, it leaves room for a correction. Surprising disappointment, we called it when we did the S&P um, Elliott wave. This wave four, what is it? personality of a way for surprising disappointment everyone's greedy everyone wants to make some money you know it's like yeah to get me in get me in and then suddenly you don't get the return that you're expecting um so you're surprisingly disappointed and then you turn neutral again and you say well let's have a look at it um and uh let's see so i i think well, I, I think it needs a little bit more fear to get to entice people into the market very good. You really, really described me well. The surprising disappointment we've seen here. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Uh, a great uh, uh, segue to Elliott Wave with Goldfinger Nick, where I will give my fantastic Gerd Fröbe impression. No, Mr. Bond, I don't want you to talk. I want you to die. <laughs> <laughs> that is that very famous line. Okay, so this will stop the other sharing screen. Do you want to continue? Yes, let me just share the desktop. Um, right. What can you see? Can you see a gold chart going back? I see a gold three months chart, uh, right, CFD good. on gold. Brilliant. I mean, I saw you comment or repost or something on Australian property versus gold on LinkedIn, right? And, and um, you know, th the fact is gold really has had a, um, an incredible history. Not as an incredible history as uh, as perhaps the stock market, but uh, but nevertheless, you know, you go back here. This is eighteen thirty three, so we're talking one hundred and ninety years worth of uh, of, uh, of price action here. And I thought I'd show it just to put it into some suspect some perspective as to perhaps where we are in this history of gold, in case people just just haven't really seen that, and so. Um, uh, you know, starting with this sort of center block here with this sort of red wave one that I sort of have labeled, it's an interpretation how I've labeled it, but let, let's just say it, it's, it's the, the starting point. When did this whole thing start on gold? It started when Nixon basically said, look, you can't convert your dollars into gold anymore. Um, and, um, and, 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 then gold started to stop being a shiny thing at $35 an ounce and, and having some freedom, freedom of movement. Um, and, um, and the initial reaction of gold versus the dollar. So it was freed up to find its right level. And, um, and, and obviously, you know, this thing went from, as I say, 35 bucks there to it looks like very close to a thousand dollars. So $900 an ounce that was the first sort of blast um, in the 70s. And then we had this sort of retracement um, down into the 90s. Then we had this other push now um, in, um, in gold. And since that point, we, you know, we went up pretty much in a straight line right up until 2012 or thereabouts. 
um, we've come back down. And then things started to kind of gradually, gradually, gradually get uh, get more interesting, right up until about 2015, where we had this sort of sideways action, um, you know, take place, this green three and green four. I don't know if you can see that in the top right. And that green three, green four, 2015, what was going on? What was going on at that time was that um, the central banks were less interested in paying, um, you know, good money for U.S. Treasuries. They'd rather pay the money for gold. And, uh, you know, that was, if you like, the starting point on on gold. Um, and I'll go into, you know, the, all this sort of stuff in the top right hand corner um, in a minute. But I um, don't know what I want to show here. Um, oil, oil ratio. So in that time, so 1951, this is right up to the present day, oil gold ratio has kind of kept its sort of range. Um, you know, see a low here at five and a high here of 35. Obviously, we've had these spikes, but, you know, the, the ratio has been contained. But these blue moving average lines, and that I've got a blue straight line and a yellow straight line, but the blue moving average line has started to creep up. And the blue moving average is a 10-year moving average of uh, this ratio. And the 10-year moving average is trading higher than the 10-year moving average of the past. Well, we know that we had a spike here in, in this ratio. So let's look at the three-year moving average. And the three-year moving average is this yellow, uh, thin yellow line. The thick yellow line just marks the high of that moving average of the past, which was 1989. So in the last three years, this moving average, this ratio is moving higher. And again, you know, obviously in the last three years, this is, you know, sort of post the initial sort of blast of the money printing, um, you know, from the central banks. You know, gold has become a little bit more interesting. And, and really, this is when kind of things started to uh, um, to take shape in, in gold. And if you want to see where is gold versus the S&P, let's look at this chart first. You know, this goes, this chart goes back to, you know, a long time. Um, this is like, you can go back 100 years if you want um, on this chart. You know, well done trading view for, for having this data. Um, simply the gold to S&P ratio, you can see that gold is very, very low versus the S&P. And you're going to rightly say to me, well, hang on a minute. Gold is just a shiny thing and the S&P pays dividends. And so... I thought I'd put up the S&P total return chart and you can see the same kind of message from the ratio that, you know, on a sort of gold shiny thing versus a dividend paying um, index, if you like, um, you know, gold is very, very cheap on a historical basis. This chart only goes back to, I think, 1988, 87. So gold kind of the sleeping giant if you like. Um, and, you know, the reason that we spoke about gold in May last year, when we began this sort of wonderful um, ex experience uh, discussing these markets, we said that gold should go up and Bitcoin should go up because, you know, why? Well, let me just pull up one more thing before we can go on to um, um, a, a, an Elliott Wave chart. Um, where will I find this? Uh, I think it's this thing. Yes, debt clock, US debt clock, right? This is looking into the future, 2028. So, I mean, we can, we can go back and just look at the current debt situation, but this is the estimate of the US national debt by the Congressional Budget Office, i.e. themselves, 40 trillion. Today it's around 35. Brilliant, there about. Um, the Office of Management and Budget say it's going to be 41 trillion. Okay, they're a bit more bearish. Um, whereas the USDC, US debt clock at current interest rates, suggests that this is going to be 46 trillion. So, what does this also tell us on this wonderful page? It says the estimated net interest on debt annually 
in 2028 is 961 billion. It's more than they spend on defense. The middle block also around 960 billion, but at current rates, it's 2.7 trillion. Now, when the Republicans and the Democrats, they have a punch up in, in uh, um, you know, in their building, and they say, oh, we want you to spend less here, and we want to spend more here, and they, they, have a, they argue about 300 billion, right? And that's what they argue about. And you put all of these voted people in to discuss and have a punch up about 300 billion. Well, the unvoted element on this, on this chart is the 2.7 trillion of interest rates. Nobody's talking about that. Nobody seems to care about that. So what do you think an elected official is going to say when he says, well, hang on a minute, what do you mean I can't spend money on defence? Or what do you mean I can't go and spend money on a road or a bridge or, you know, especially now? Um, what do you mean we haven't got any money? 2.7 trillion at current rates. What do you think is going to happen? What do you think they want to do with interest rates? Well, they're going to do it anyway, right? Well, they can with yield curve control. They can if they start force the whole savings community in America to actually buy um, treasury bonds. They can if they fudge around the rules of Basel, where banks, how much capital banks have to set aside for putting risky assets on their books. Um, you know, they can say, well, actually, you know, you don't have to worry about capital for when you buy US government bonds. You can have that for nothing. So these supplementary leverage ratio, they've already adjusted it once in 2020. They no doubt will do that again, um, in my view. And um, I mean, I just wanted to put it into context, right? So you've got gold for cheap versus S&P. You've got, you know, this sort of crazy world of, of debt and interest uh, in the future. And what do you think interest is going to, interest rates going to have to do? And what do you think when the, you know, the classic retail investor, again, sees low interest rates, um, um, you know, down his, down his uh, sort of local savings bank, uh, it's, you know, it's going to be back to the shiny thing he's selling at the moment. It's only central banks who are buying. So let's go back to this sort of charm. We said, OK, there was a long term history. And unfortunately, I don't have the history on this chart. The uh, data is, is not good. But um, we said 2015 was the last high on gold. Well, 2012 was the last high on gold and it went down. And then it's come back up. And the green line or the green block here marks this former high. Um, you know, most technical analysts um, would say that when you break a high, which was in place for many years, so in this case, it was the highest since 2011 or 12 or whatever it was, um, at uh, roughly 2000, you break that high. And that high, which was resistance, is now support. There is a strong likelihood if you maintain, you know, monthly closing above that, um, and you go above that by a certain percentage, um, the likelihood is that the price of the asset, doesn't matter what it is, gold or stock or a thing, um, will double or treble. So in the famous words of we're at 2,000 and we're going to double, you said to me before we came on air, were well, you going to say that gold goes up to 4,000? Well, double 2,000 is 4,000. So just on that sort of very basic kind of analysis, yeah, probably, I mean, uh, that gold will, will find its its way in a non-straight line way um, towards um, towards 4,000, at least, you know, if not the triple, you know, worry about that later. Those are, those are sort of different conversations. But yeah, so um, if we just quickly come back to that original sort of chart that I showed, I'm not sure it's this one, I think it's this one. We are now looking at the kind of history of the price action from where my cursor is um, upwards. So you see the long-term history here, and I'm just going to focus on this last bit from that low in October 2015. Um, you know, what did we do from that low? And that's sort of this kind of area here. So from an Elliott Wave perspective, we look as though we've done a one, a two. Remember from an Elliott Wave thing, an impulse wave, that's a thing going the major trend, that's the impulse thing, even if it's down, it's in five waves. So we want to count to five. So technically, we can actually count to five. We can say, you know, one, two, and then here this sort of um, um, within three, there's five waves, one, two, three, four, five. So it's wave three, one, two, three. 
Then we went down to, you know, in 2022, when most things went down, when, you know, everyone was sort of worried about 8% interest rates, whatever. Um, and um, and then we started to go back up again. And, and so far, even with the sort of, you know, an interesting way to count this, I can only count three ways. I can count one, two, three. But the way I count this one, two, three is to say, if I am in wave five, so I've got wave four labeled here, and I'm looking for wave five. Wave five has had five waves. So it's had five waves here, didn't finish, went down. Now, in my view, we're starting the next lot of five waves. So one, one here, two, three, four, five. And that's what I think we're going to do. So we might see a little bit of retracement down to two, one, two, two, something like that um, um, for this uh, for this part of the move before we see the next part of the move. So what are the targets? I mean, we already mentioned a target of um, um, around 4,000, but that's sort of non-Elliott Wave targets. But, you know, we can start to look at Elliott Wave targets much higher and, um, um, you know, but I think realistically, we don't want to get people too excited about stuff like this. We just want to say here, it does look as though, um, you know, the market is uh, um, ready to uh, uh, to make further moves up. Something wrong there, change that. Um, but basically, you know, we've done one, two, then one, two, and then three, and then four, and so on and so forth. So that is the the kind of the basic Elliott wave pattern that I see that we're still in an impulse wave and still going up. And so what the, do I want to say? One, one question, Nick. The, the, yeah, the, okay. cor the correction now should take us actually back to a test of the former resistance to see whether it holds as a support. And uh, then we're open to the upside in that count. Yeah, um, it, it could do. I mean, I, I don't want to see it down there for, you know, for, for, for various reasons. Um, but, you know, generally, and there's nothing to stop it. The, the key point for a wave one is not to sort of break, um, you know, the previous low. But generally, uh, wave two normally corrects around 50%. But when you get something very, very bullish, The wave twos, you know, don't necessarily have to go down to 50%. So, but anyway, let's, you know, one step at a time. Um, you know, we this really is a one step at a time. Um, and we're not bullish on gold just because it's gone above this green thing. Although some people only started to get bullish on gold after it went above the green line here because it sort of broke the previous highs. Of course, You know, we've been talking about gold for a lot longer and, um, you know, for good reasons, um, you know, gold should do well. So what do I want to see? I want to see if, the you know, the macro is right. I want to see Bitcoin doing well. Well, it, well, it has been. Forget this weekend for the moment. Um, I want to see silver start to outperform. And of course, here's a silver chart. Silver has been in an absolute sideways pattern for, and my data only goes up to 2015 on this chart. But, um, you know, what's silver done? Silver's done kind of a five-wave move. It looks like possibly here, here um, is the end. Then it looks like it's done some kind of triangle around here. Um, and then we want to see it go up. And so what are the targets for silver? Um, you know, normal target, I would say, is $40 or around $60. So reasonable. Uh, this is one count, alternative count. I think that's on this chart. Is um, is a little bit more sort of a bullish count. So we went one, if you like, A, B is a correction, and then we're doing one, two, three, four, five. You know, it also takes us up to 50, but you know, this 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 chart can go um, a, a lot higher. What else do I want to see? I want to see gold miners um, do well. So GDX, GDX is um, um, can do the Elliott wave on that, which I have done. So I've tried to sort of say, okay, again, similar to silver, we had this sort of sideways action, um, which looked like a triangle, you know, coming from the former high back here. Uh, let's go back here. So former high here, and it looks like a whole triangle thing. Um, some previous bullish action here, which stopped in 2020 mid, they just traded sideways like silver. But now we are starting to approach former highs and and that's pretty bullish and um and for me this triangle ended here of course in the rules of triangle this low here 
is not allowed to break that low there, um, this C low. So the E low is not allowed to break the C low. Let's just check that that is still 68. Yeah, it's very good. Um, so you see this 6, 2567 was that low, 2562 was that low. There's one of these rules in, in Elliot, these things that make me nervous when I sort of get that close. Um, and it did get that close. And it does look as though we are starting to um, um, get bullish. And usually once this sort of BD line is broken, that again gets people excited um, as being a confirmation that we're breaking out of the triangle. And, and you know, that looks as, uh, as though we are. And what do triangles do? Well, you know, they measure their move. They have targets up here and we can look at these targets. Um, you know, the 138.2 and 1.272 is between 50 and 53 for the GDX. In my view, do your own research um, and all of that stuff. But uh, in my view, that's probably where we are likely to head for. Again, not in a straight line, but it does look as though we are starting some impulsive price action on the way up. So I think, who is buying all that stuff? Well, okay, let's go back to gold because gold, I said that the retail investor has been a major seller, mainly in Germany, actually, um, of gold. Why is that? I mean, I bought this stuff, you know, in the year 2000, 2005, 2010. I've been buying since that time every year, um, a small amount um, and these guys have just been seeing nothing in this price section, nothing. So they suddenly see a profit, say, get me out. So the retail investor is getting out. Um, but the central banks, we know, since 2015 or thereabouts, they have preferred gold as a reserve asset rather than um, US Treasury bonds. And the reason is, one is geopolitical problems. They don't, they're a bit worried about sort of perhaps that the, uh, the, the central banks might do to them what they threaten to do to Russia and take the money. So they say, okay, forget that. We don't trust you. Um, but on the other side, you know, the, the level of debt, the supply of this asset called a US Treasury bond is growing at the rate of 7 8% a year. The supply is growing at that level. So do you want to buy, have something in your hands which is growing at that level of supply or something which is growing at the supply rate of less than 2% a year? And I think um, for all of the above reasons, central banks around the world are saying, well, OK, I need to increase the amount of gold that I've got as my reserves. And I need to replace the U.S. treasuries that I've got and let them run off. I don't necessarily just dump this stuff. It's in no one's interest. Um, and um, and they're replacing it with uh, with with gold. So gold being the plausible restart mechanism if you eventually have to come up with your new currency right Correct. you need and, to have some backup absolutely i mean you know the BRICS have talked about you know a their own new currency you know whether it's in digital form whether it's gold backed digital form whether it's something else um we we still don't know details of that but they do definitely want to minimize the amount of of, of dollar usage that they they have in trading we know they're doing that we know that oil companies prefer now to sort of have a stable um, um, ratio and oil gold is probably a lot more stable than um, oil dollar. Um, and, um, and for that reason, I think, you know, you're seeing this, uh, this, this, this part of the world, the BRICS world, um, as I say, gradually increasing. And it's not just the BRICS world. I mean, you know, other countries have kind of figured that out. Um, and uh, and are gradually adding to reserves. That's fascinating. Um, if any, uh, how do you call them, trilateral commission or, or uh, uh, what's that growth in California are listening? My idea has always been do the Knights Templar move, build a big fortress in Switzerland, put gold in, tokenize it, and you have a stable currency. But that would obviously defeat the object. You can't manipulate it anymore, can you? And, and that's the thing, you see, politicians, um, I, I remember listening to Yanni Varoufakis, the Greek finance minister, um, when he was talking about Bitcoins, ah, what a load of rubbish, you know, that's no you, no good, because <laughs> how do you just suddenly expand the supply when you want to? Well, that's the whole point. Um, you don't. And, 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 you know, it is a normal thing 
for politicians to want to expand the supply because then they can do and stay in power because at the end of the day, you know, that's how they stay in power because they do make promises. But as we know, those promises, whether they're pension promises, whether they are, you know, we're going to build a bridge promise or whatever it is, or we're going to increase, um, you know, the standard of living so you don't need to work anymore so that we can get more control. All of these things can only be done if they've got the tap, which allows them to turn on the supplier. And what they don't want to see is some central bank cocking it up by raising interest rates. So the, you know, if you ask me, and I've said this sort of on numerous occasions over the last two years to clients, you know, the central banks will become less um, independent and more, um, you know, the, the arm of government if you like. I mean, the, the, the Japanese central bank arguably is, you know, already an arm of government, but um, the Western central banks are most likely going to become that way, um, officially. Uh, unofficially, they will never, ever say that. Um, but but officially, I mean, you've got to sort of wonder whether they can continue to, to go on like this with so much debt. Well, it's... it's and with that interest rate level. You made you mentioned the debt. You know, one of these things we had the debt cloth on the screen, and it's actually terrifying if you look at it. The one thing uh, I remember, even in the olden days when we both were young, people were talking about unfunded liabilities. Have yeah. you had that conversation recently? Once in a while, somebody's mentioning it, but they make this topic appear very, very disappear very, very fast. If you put that on top, well, I think it's uh, the only solution. Uh, eventually to solve that problem will come back to a stable currency uh, which is gold-backed in some way shape or form if you if you hit the history books Hilmar, Hil Hilmar Schacht uh, the German uh, central banker before the Nazis when when we had the hyperinflation uh, uh, in Germany and nobody wanted the Reichsmark anymore he tied the new currency to a portfolio of land and ground because that was the only way people were remotely accepting that thing to use as a medium of exchange. Poor old Quasi Quateng of, uh, of UK Chancellor fame, um, Liz Truss, you know, the, the lettuce thing. It wasn't really their fault. I mean, actually, to be fair, uh, you know, on the record, I think what they did was, uh, was the right thing. Um, yeah, well, hey, and he was one of my former colleagues. When I was sending outside smoking in front of the door, there was always this chap with a very expensive suit coming in. And then you say, yeah, oh, well, I used to work with the former ch uh, chancellor in that, the UK. Oh, but I, I was absolutely on, on his side, not on, on her side necessarily, because I think she didn't know what she was doing. But yeah, he I had agree. I, I think he was a better man um, in, in the job. Um, put it this way. But nevertheless, um, you know, she gave them free reign. And yields were already blasting higher in the yep. UK anyway because yep. of what the central bank was doing. And, of course, you know, he comes in and comes up with some, okay, how they handled it was wrong. He should have gone to, um, you know, a sovereign wealth fund, said this is what we're going to do. You're going to back us, um, you know, just to stabilise the situation. He didn't kind of handle it well, irrespective he underestimated what the so yields went up a little bit more. They were already going up, yeah. um, but yields went up. Unfunded liabilities. That's what he tried. The Americans do that every day. So they're the only country in the world to be able to do that. And imagine the power you can yield um, as a nation that you can do something that the Chinese can't do, that the UK can't do, that the French can't do, that the Germans can't do, the French would love to do this stuff. I mean, they 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 really despise the Americans for, for being able to have this power because at the end of the day, they see the value in, in this thing. And so, uh, you know, sooner or later, somebody is in, in you know, an ally is going to say, well, hang on a minute, you just can't keep doing that because you're affecting the whole world with your currency, with your interest rates, with your... You know, all of this stuff, your capital is flooding away from from our country and going into your country. And, and it's doing it because you continue to just pump and print and whatever. Well, those are sort of conversations for another day. But um, but for now, the, the sort of the consequences that uh, monetary inflation hedges, which have worked over last year, um, last year's, um, will likely continue to work, not in a straight line. And um, 
but you've got to be careful as an investor and you've got to think about well, how do I protect myself against a situation like this and uh, you know and that's why people are start, started to look at XLE last year sort of energy stocks because yeah. you want some kind of inflation monetary inflation hedges not the other type of inflation which everyone gets excited about wrongly but um, the monetary inflation hedges which is much more important Let's have that as famous last words, Nick. Uh, well, th thank you very much for the fantastic analysis on gold. Um, what I took away as a humble trader, I'll wait for a little correction, then I'll load up. Um, yeah, well, sorry. Uh, the the long-term numbers make sense. Uh, the view you just explained to us makes a lot of sense. Yes, at the moment, the markets in gold seems to be a bit frothy. but uh, yeah. yeah, I would say so. Um, it's one of these counterintuitive, and especially when you mentioned that, especially the German retail guys who were bullish for gold for a long, long time where nothing happened, uh, starting to unload their holdings. Uh, sorry, it can't get any better, can it? And, and well, you know, I, I can't say that. I live here. So, uh, <laughs> Lovely. And thank you very much for that, Nick. Thank you for watching us. If you like that, share, subscribe. And I hope we will all see you next week with new shenanigans going on in the marvelous world of finance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. See you.